we all know why you're here. You want some more of that effing weird info. Well, we got that for you on today's episode. I'm one of your hosts, Alex. I'm Leo. I'm Ro. And I'm Tristan. And for this episode, we are going to discuss a little bit of the mysterical and mythology when it comes to creatures. Like last week's episode, we took some areas in which we wanted to present to you, the audience, with some creatures you may not be so familiar with. Today, I'm going to be starting us off, um, and yeah, I'm going to take you on this journey of more effing weird creatures. So, for my research, what I did was I stuck with two things this time. <laughs> it is, uh, it's going to, I'm going to be talking about angels, and I'm also going to be talking about locusts from the Bible. So, that's where my research lied, and there are four different angels that I'm going to talk about. There's three that I'm going to focus more on. There's one that I'm going to mention that is the probably the typical angel that you have in your mind or what you're picturing. But I'm not going to talk about that one first. The first one I'm going to talk about is the uh, <laughs> I hate the names <laughs> <laughs> is that cur- Curibium Curibium Chur- something like Curibium. that. Curibium Cher- thank you, Tristan. The cher- th- I'm glad you're here. Cherubim, thank you. So the cherubim in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet's vision depict, depicts them as having four faces, that of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human. They have straight legs, uh, four wings, and a bull's bull hooves, uh, four feet that gleam like polished brass, and what's one set of wings that covers the body and then the other is used for flight. So I do have a picture of this that I'm going to drop in the chat right now so everyone can can see it. All right, so what I just dropped in the chat. So as you can see, this is not what your typical angel looks like. So the typical angels that everyone thinks about or, you know, has in their mind, I think, is the Malachim, which looks exactly like a person just without wings, and they act on God's behalf. Uh, that's what the Malachim do. Uh, so there's, I, th- I think it, were, it said that there was four, three or four different ranking systems with with angels, and if I'm not misspoken, I think the Cherubim is the third or the second one as far as like the ranking system. But the cherubim are the ones that guard sacred places. So if someone dies or something like that, or there's, you know, I guess whatever would be considered sacred, the cherubim angel would be the one that would, you know, be there. Uh, the next one that I'm going to talk about is the, <laughs> the seraphim. Seraphim. Sir, Tristan, you're just on it today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that one, I'm going to send another picture in the chat. Where are the uh, Malachi in the ranking? Sorry to interrupt you there, but I forget. Are they the lower ones or the higher ones? I, I, I forget that because they look like people, and I can't remember if that puts them at like the bottom tier or are they. Yes. That's okay. That's yep. what I thought. Yep. Since, and I don't know if that's just because they don't like look special in any sort of way because like all of them. All the ones besides the Malachium look very unusual. They're, they're not like the typical angels that, you know, are on like stained glass mirrors and, mm. you know, like on dinner Eight. plates during Christmas time. It's yeah, it's so they're they're at the very bottom. Um, I want to see those seraphims on dinner plates at a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is is that a good in the middle? Yeah, so these yep. the seraphim has six wings. Two to technically, there's two to cover the face, two to cover the feet, and then two to fly. And it's the second highest. There we go. It's the second highest in the ranking of angels. Uh, so typically, I don't think you would see the face. Um, in I mean, I I don't know for certain, but two of those wings, their purpose is to cover the face of the angel. Um, which is very, I mean, I mean, you can just see it. This is someone's painting of it. I I dropped another picture in the chat 
Um, so it's that's kind of what it looks like. I also did see something on the internet where someone like made a uh, like a 3D image of it, and I do remember seeing this one, and it, it is pretty intense. Um, as far as like the size, I don't know, and that's just another thing is I don't know the size of these angels. I don't know if they're like a hundred feet tall, if there's something. I think it varies, doesn't it? Aren't they like omnipotent so they can be whatever the hell they want? I, and that's what I think is I, I think that as far as like angels go and these creatures, I think they can really be whatever size and, you know, that they want to be. I, I don't. I don't know. It never gave a like exact height. What? No one went out and measured them. <laughs> I mean, I if I were to see now, here's here's a funny thing: is that typically what it says in the Bible um, is that anytime an angel uh, was shown or, or came to like a man, like in the in the Bible, it always says that the men were scared or like you know um, the angels had to say, "Do not fear." But when I an angel appeared. Why. Well, well, here's but here's the thing is like whenever an angel appeared to a woman, it's never said that she is scared or the angels never said, do not be scared. So it's it's really interesting that in in the Bible that they that 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 happened. Um, But kind of moving on from that, the last one and this is the highest. And so. All right. So I guess I just figured out the ranking system. So the last (laughs) one, the (laughs) the oh, the oh, phenom, oh, phenom. I don't Ophnium. know that one off the top of my head now. <laughs> Ophanium. Uh, Ophanium. I don't know. Some O P H A N I M. Ophanium. Ophanium. <laughs> oh I would say Ophanium would be what I would how I would go with that, but I could probably yes. be wrong. Now these this one is probably the the most unusual looking one of them all. So it's it's a set of wheels. Yeah. Um, the most it's the most bizarre looking one in the Bible and Ezekiel's account in the Bible describes them as being made of interlocking gold wheels with each wheel exterior covered with multiple eyes. They move by floating themselves in the sky and it is the highest in the hierarchy of angels. So this one is again, I will drop a picture in the chat so you can see what it looks like or it's, it's off. depiction. It's Offenum is what how it's pronounced. Offenum. Okay. Yep. So as you can see right here, this is the uh, artist's kind of rendition of the um, Ophenium. <laughs> and it, it's it's pretty on. Un- uh, yeah. And like, that's the thing is like, if, if I were to see something like this, I think I would be terrified, especially if it were to have like eyes blinking at you and everything. <laughs> it's like, the eyes it, that are the scariest part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But to have this thing like talking to you in some sort of way like that, to me, I think that would be pretty creepy too. Mm-hmm. But the Ophanium is the highest. And then the second one is the Seraphium, followed by the Cherubium. And then the last one is the Mel. Malachim, Mal- Malachim, Malachim, which is the normal looking person. So um, it didn't say what the Ophanium, like what their responsibility was as far as, um, oh, actually, you know, it, it did. My, my mistake. It says that they were there to guard God's throne. So I don't know if there's multiple ones. I don't know if there's just one, but that is the, that is their purpose. Now there was a, um, there was a former NASA employee who theorized what Ezekiel's visions were, were actually UFO sightings. Uh, I believe the person's name was Joseph F. Bulmrich, who, who said that. Um, and I've, I think we've talked about that before. And something that I had said before, too, is that if these are things that are happening way back in the day, you're only going to associate with things that you know. So if no one knew about UFOs, spaceships, everything like that. They could have thought that an alien ship or a UFO, whatever it is, was an angel. So I, you know, I, I would agree to a certain, you know, extent and everything like that. Um, if you do believe in Jesus and God like that, I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, but it, you know, I, I do see that as being a possibility. Um, let's see here. The other thing that I wanted to get into were the locuses. 
that are depicted in the Bible. Now these, <laughs> let me pull up the picture real quick. Now the, the locuses I thought were pretty cool. Um, and then the last picture it's in the, it's in the chat. That is what locuses from the book of revelations are depicted as. Now that is, oh my goodness. it is not a typical <laughs> locust. What are you laughing at Tristan? <laughs> not at all. Picture, man. That's like, they look so scared. There's like the two guys in there. He's the ones falling down and, uh, that guy on the bottom left, look at the, just the look of terror on his face. <laughs> well, so uh, I'll, I'll read about him a little bit or like the, so now again, the, the book of revelations in the Bible is all prophecy. It is not like a sentence. I wouldn't say it's not set in stone, but it is again, visions and prophecies. So are they exactly going to look like this? If there is an end of days based on the Bible, it's possible um, but here's a little passage from Revelations 9, 3 through 10. So it goes, um, Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but do not kill them. And their torment was like the torment of scorpions when it stings someone. In the appearance of the locusts, they were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were that were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. So if you, if you look at the locuses based on this artist's rendition of it, it has a human face with a gold crown, um, something that it doesn't say or doesn't kind of specify. Now, this is, I think what the artist has wrong is that these locuses, it doesn't give the, again, their size. So in the artist thing, it has them as like big as a, like a dragon or something like that. <laughs> Whereas, like, it, it, they could just be, like, the normal size of a locust, what we have here on Earth now. Again, I don't know, um, but they are, the, based on this artist's rendition of them, they do look pretty pretty freaky looking. They look like something from a, like a sci-fi movie or something like that. They're, they're pretty creepy. Uh, let's see. So something I want to bring up is the fact that these locusts in the Book of Revelations were not allowed to kill anybody, but more or less torment them for five months. Um, it also says that people are going to want to die, but death will elude them. Now, something that I thought about this, and this is, again, why I wanted to bring this up in, as far as, like, these creatures, is that I've always, like, I wondered, okay, so what if someone tries to kill themselves during this time and these locusts around is there going to be something where it's like the locusts don't allow that to happen for whatever reason? I don't know. I don't want to bring up like a, a, you know, a weird subject matter and everything like that. But I think it's very interesting that people will not be allowed to die for these five months and instead be tormented by these locusts. Um, so that that's something that I was thinking about. Um, and then some more thoughts that I kind of had was, again, kind of what we talked about with the angels and again, off away from the locusts was um, why these creatures, why the angels were always depicted differently or are never depicted as the, what are their names again? Uh, the Ophium, Ophium, the Cherubim, or the, what was it? The Seraphim. Like it, to me, I would almost... <laughs> I think those things look pretty cool, you know, or like they're pretty interesting. Um, oh. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. It's just it's something that I find is very weird that you don't see that in like any sort of movies that, you know, because there's like, what is it? Um, not Lifetime movies, but there is like a Christian based um, like movie company. And they, from my understanding, they never have these angels that are depicted like that it's always like you know someone in a robe there's a glowing light it's more of the malik malakim malachim that they depict rather than any of these other ones now again it could be because these are very scary looking angels and they are very unusual and it just may be something that like we can't comprehend as humans like that something could be made like that i don't know uh, but i know as for me like as a little kid i would have loved to see more of that um, <laughs> happen and everything. So, you know, that's, that's really where my research lied. I just wanted to bring up those two things, um, because I found those to be the most interesting, 
uh, within the Bible text when it comes to to creatures and everything like that. So that's 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 what I had. I wonder with the uh, locust, because um, it says it's supposed to torment them, but like yeah, in the picture, it looks like it's about ready to eat them. But I wonder if they yeah. were actually small. Because um, think about it, if it was basically this thing and it was really small, but there were say millions of them, that would be pretty fucking tormenting. Well, that's what I mean. Is like imagine a creature that has a little tiny human face <laughs> and everything like that. I think that would be scarier than like a big so creature. Scary. Yeah, yeah, it's. <laughs> I they really say do this. not need the scorpion sting, to be quite honest. If they have a <laughs> tiny human face. <laughs> For some reason, looking at them, it reminds me of the insect creatures from it's like an anime called Terra from Mars, and they look like this. Terror, the movie's called Terror from Mars? Yeah, like Terraformers, but it's Terra, oh. T-E-R-R-A, and then F-O-R-M-A-R-S. But those are supposed to be roaches, what I just <laughs> said in the chat. Oh, it's a ripped ugh. roach, man. <laughs> yeah, that's evolution. <laughs> it, it does look like a, a like a jacked cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why, but like seeing the picture of the locust, I thought of that it like immediately, like just mutated oversized bugs. But they don't look. I mean, they kind of look the same. I mean, it's a it looks like a bug with a human face, but yeah, I yep. mean, I, I guess I can kind of see it. <laughs> For me, it, it it reminded me of the movie Tusk. <laughs> oh, that's you a guys good know one. What I'm talking about? Yeah. Yes. Oh. So I was thinking about Dogma the whole time he was talking about angels too. So that's funny. <laughs> oh. And the other well, thing I was those, thinking about with the locust, yeah. like, what well, if they won't let him die for five years? I mean, it's not saying that like five months. Five months, sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't think it was yep. really talking about the person, like, quote unquote, killing themselves. I think it meant, like, whatever else is unleashed in that hellscape isn't supposed to kill them for five months, would be my guess. Because I don't think they're okay. the ones doing the killing. I'm assuming if there's those things, there's probably more, right? M more, like, types of creatures that are out there. Like, well, that's I, like a post apocalyptic prophecy, right? I, again, I'm not, I, I don't know a lot about the Bible. I don't know like every little aspect, but I, I do think the way that the book of revelations is prophesized is that it's different waves. So like the first wave is like the locusts. Now, correct me. I don't know if it's the first wave or not, but it's like, there's this that happens and then that stops and then this happens and then it stops. And then like, I think the very end is, I think just God and the de devil going at it. And everything, so like in a boxing ring. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. If it's a, I mean, maybe I don't know, but yeah, I, I, uh, I'd be I, like, I, well, the wreck, uh, Ragnarok, the record of Ragnarok. Are you talking about the 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 is it the Hulk and um, Thor? Thor. Nah, it's uh, it's another anime. Big nerd. Uh, but oh. it's basically when like different <laughs> gods and goddesses from different um, mythos like fight humans mm -hmm. for survival. It's really cool. They fight humans. Yeah, like they are basically like get your strongest humans and we'll fight them against these gods. And if y'all win, y'all could y'all could live for like another thousand well, years. That's not fair. Are, are the humans you gotta alive? see. It. I mean, some of those humans are like, wow, you know, like because they're given like. Um, weapons imbued with like the angels of what's it called the valkyries i think it was they're like they turn themselves into weapons that the humans can use to like have a chance against the gods you're gonna have to drop the name of these all these movies that you're talking about i gotta i gotta catch up on that stuff I, so we know what you're talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, Ro, I just saw the picture of Tusk in the chat. Please, please know. That was a nightmare movie. <laughs> yes, I agree. Leo, what did you, you picked Native American creatures, correct? Yes, I found a few uh, from different origins. So just a disclaimer for everyone listening. Uh, stories do get a little gruesome, so proceed with caution. Uh, <laughs> But starting off, we all know, of course, of the commonly spoken creatures like skinwalkers who can shapeshift and everything, and wendigos, cannibalistic spirits or beasts. 
Uh, but I'm going to try to cover things that were, I tried to find things that were a little more obscure. Starting this off, I had found a Inuit sea monster called the Kalapalik, which was a, a sea creature that resembled human, half human, half fish. Gonna send a photo of that in the chat here. I hope it's top half fish. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, it's like a perfect hybrid, I guess you could say. <laughs> kind of like the cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it actually kind of is. Okay. And these are typically seen in the Arctic regions like Alaska, Canada, Greenland, uh, usually lurking under the frigid waters, uh, preying on children. So it's kind of like their their boogeyman almost, hmm. and they're described as having green skin with long nails. So not like swamp monster scary, but still pretty unsettling when you look at pictures of it. And similar to a siren, it has like a it, it'll hum uh, while it's like lurking underneath the ice and everything. So that was kind of like a, a giveaway to know that it's close, which is. A, possibly where they got the stories of sirens from or you know like a possible link between sirens and, and these specific creatures as far as like music goes i think what i think any creature that you depict that can be underneath the water like because i what we talked about this i think in the last episode about the fear of like the uh the, what's like underneath you like the abyss you know like when you're swimming the um, last of phobia Yes. yes. That's a phobia. Yeah. 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 So if you were to say like there's something like a creature like this just hanging out, like swimming at the depths, you know, gonna grab your toes while you're swimming. <laughs> you no, <know>? thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but one of the things it does to try to lure children close to like openings in the ice is it'll tap on the ice, kind of like Ooh, you know, up. like it's basically knocking on the door. And of course a curious child would, hey, what's that? And then Oh, there they go. That's messed up. But I mean, like, if, I mean, it's, I think it's a good way though, you know, to like, maybe like try to like help your kids not go near open parts of the ice, you know, like if you hear tapping, don't go near open parts. Cause it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a way to like, they might like fall in or something like that. So like, you know, what can we do to keep the kids away from it? All right. Well, if you hear tapping, there's going to be someone down there. They're going to snatch you up. I, I wouldn't even go on the ice if I was a kid. Also, Leo has, I don't know, why do you bring stories where the kids are getting snatched away? In the last episode, there was a bird. (laughs) Listen, listen, I got nothing against kids, I promise. It just so happens. But yeah, you're not far from the truth. That's that's partly why they do pass this story down generations is to like encourage kids to stay away from, you know, the edges of the ice and stuff to avoid danger. That makes sense. Yep. And it's interesting, too, because although they are reported to dwell in the water, they have also been reported to, like, surface near the edge and, like, snatch kids up and put them in what's called a amatik, which was like a parka that that people would use to carry the children. I'm going to send a photo of that as well. But it's it's unsettling. Like, just see the little poor child. Oh, Oh, my. (laughs) Yeah. The kid is crying. I don't think you do like kids, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a photo about to, to portray what we're talking about. But yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so that's what's normally worn by the Inuit women. But of course, they have that to make it easier to, you know, take them down with them. But it's mm-hmm. reported that if kids are caught, that they're stuck with the creature forever. And that's how they maintain their uh, their their young appearance. Like the first picture I shown, that's how they like stay forever young. Well, that second picture, they must have just caught that kid now because they are old looking. You know, like you compare the two images and everything. So, are they depicted as being like pretty? You know, like mermaid, siren type creatures, or are they more monster like? Does it say? I think it depends on if they're out of the water and just how they choose to, to like portray themselves or like you said, it might even be like they're just they haven't gotten a snack yet. You know what I'm saying? So they're starting to <laughs> <A> age. <snack. laughs> <laughs> yeah, they haven't haven't gotten their daily, you know, vitamin K of kids. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's one of them. So um, don't don't go near the water if you're ever <laughs> out in the ice, you know, the Arctic's. <laughs> Now, the next one is a little more, I guess, grounded. (laughs) 
It's called a Uctena, which is the Cherokee's horned serpent. So essentially a giant menacing looking snake. Uh, some depictions show it as a serpent with wings about the size of a tree trunk. Although I haven't seen anything about it flying, more so like it slithers much like a snake does. Let me just find the picture for that as well. But it's a pretty big, a big, pretty big snake. I mean, think like anaconda or snakes on a plane kind of size. I refuse to watch that movie. <laughs> it, it, I love B movies. Like I love the Sci Fi Channel and all those movies. But there's just something about snakes on the plane and Samuel Jackson that I just I don't think I could enjoy it. <laughs> oh, okay. Ooh. Looks more like a dragon. Yeah, it does yeah. Like a dragon. So it's said to have scales that look like flames, as you can see in the picture, and fangs almost like a dragon, kind of, sort of. And it has a, a translucent gem on its forehead, much like a diamond. And the story goes that if someone was somehow able to get that, that diamond on its forehead, that they would be considered the greatest wonder worker of the tribe. Now, although the diamond can be seen as a like a, a reward for some. I uh, think like the anglerfish with the light dangling, it's almost like that where mm, there's mm. been reports of people being entranced by the diamond and so caught up with trying to get it that they end up a meal for the serpent. Now, the pictures that you sent, they don't have any wings on them. Yeah, I think the depiction, I haven't found one with that showed them with wings, but I have like read in the stories that they sometimes are depicted, but I'm guessing it's kind of like docile wings are just kind of like unused and they're kind of just crumpled up to the side. Because again, it usually is depicted as slithering around or kind of just being in the water. So I don't think it really has a need for the wings, but they're kind of just there because maybe they descend from actually, you know, like from Eastern or European dragons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's supposed to be scary, but I think it looks majestic. I do too. I mean, if I see that in person, I'm like, okay, I got to go. But yeah. in pictures, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in pictures, it definitely looks like really, really cool. Yeah. Like yeah. Final Boss in a game, you know? <laughs> the Final <laughs> Boss. It kind of does. Well, that's pretty interesting. Now, um, I do like the the fact that you bring you brought up like the angler fish where like people could become entranced with it. Now is did you find that anywhere like written that 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 can happen or it is did happen? I did read stories about it happening like to people. Uh, I haven't gotten any names or anything like that, but I have oh, heard yeah. like people like you know within tribes I talked about like oh he got snatched up by he went searching for the serpent and didn't come back, so they just assumed like okay he must have got you know, taken away. And the, the diamond is like, it's translucent. So almost like it kind of like shines like actual diamonds do. So I think that's mm -hmm. also what makes it so like alluring. It's like, oh, I could just, I could just grab it and run, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But according to legend, uh, the serpent was created as a means to kill the people on earth long ago. I didn't find why, uh, but a man was apparently like transformed into that and had failed his mission, and so the responsibility was passed to the rattlesnake, who, you know, was successful, as many reports of death by rattlesnake is. Uh, but other tales show or say that this that this, the serpent is like a representation of the underworld, and is spawned from negative emotions like strong uh, fits of jealousy or envy or rage or things like that. And they're usually in caves or other spots that are kind of like isolated, like tops of mountains and. You know, other like caverns and stuff like that. And one of the most interesting stories I heard or had read about was apparently a fight between this the serpent here and like giant birds that have apparently metal wings. Um, but the story goes for that is that locals had been getting attacked by the giant birds called uh, Lanua and... So what they planned to do was to take the eggs of the birds and throw them into the river so the snake could eat them, which, of course, caused the two to fight. And the birds did end up victorious, so that got rid of the snake problem. Mm -hmm. So basically it was like a means of kind of like getting, like distracting the birds away from them because apparently the birds were snatching up livestock and children. Don't say mm. anything about mentioning children again, okay? <laughs> I, I know it, it's the second time in this podcast. But, yeah, so basically... They were frustrated with that that going on, so they decided, you know what, we're going to make the snake fight the birds. And I'm guessing that cut down the birds' numbers to the point of the birds being less of a problem or being more distracted by the snakes. So they succeeded in 
you know, like lure them away from the, the, the tribes and everything. And, you know, I basically wiped out some of the snakes in the process as well. So it's just one less thing to worry about. But yeah, that was a pretty cool story to read about. I was like, okay. And there was even one that I saw where apparently someone was actually successful in obtaining the diamond from the snake's head. And the person that was doing the extensive research on the snake had went to a tribe and there were reports of the diamond being there with the tribe, but because he was an outsider, they couldn't, he couldn't see it. But I just thought that it was like pretty interesting. It's like, what would they have to gain to make up a story like that? You know, but also on the other side of like, what did, who, who came forth and said, Hey, I have this diamond and you know, what did it look like? What did it really appear to be? I thought that was like pretty interesting. Something that I know that a lot like like you, Ro and Tristan, based on your stories, something that I know kind of comes up a lot is like, where do these these stories have to derive from somewhere or something, you know? So like, what if there really was a giant snake like this? Maybe there was only one, but like it it did look exactly like how you were you were saying. It just there wasn't very many of them and then it died out and everything like that. But someone was able to grab that like that um, that stone or that diamond that was on that snake and everything like that. I just I just find it very fascinating that, you know, like what if one of these stories, you know, is true and everything like to find that out, that would that would be pretty, pretty cool and everything. Yeah, I think that it may come from like giant snakes of the prehistoric periods, you know, like they found giant fossils of the snakes and was like, okay, mm, you know, like mm-hmm. this is, this is real. And even maybe even like our ancestors were around that time where there were snakes big enough to, to cause some real damage. And maybe this, the, the diamond that they speak of was like a, a scale that was different from the rest and kind of like sure. shined more than the others. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. That might be what that is. You know, I didn't even take into account the possibility of like, you know, back in like, I don't know, 17, 1600, whatever, just someone finding a fossil of a giant snake or a giant animal like this and then coming up with, you know, a story of what they, they think might have happened. It's almost exactly like how we find fossils and then we, you know, do 3D imagery and like kind of come up with our own theories as to what they may look like, everything right. like that. So like I know <laughs> in Jurassic Park, they're all like lizard-like. They don't, you know, they – They look like dinosaurs, how you would think. But in actuality, don't they, don't dinosaurs, like most of them have feathers? Because like dinosaurs are like birds were dinosaurs, right? I I might be wrong. Like later ones did. Um, Certain types, it's, they were very varied. But uh, I know I've mentioned this before, it's like so many of the fossils and like evidence from prehistoric times is gone, like 90% of it. Imagine the amount of ancient people that like found fossils that we had no concept of. We never found them. And like our preservation methods are quite advanced to keep these things from breaking because they're so fragile. So like Mm -hmm. how many ancient cultures, because snakes is a common thing across the world as like giant snakes being just a terrifying fucking thing. So (laughs) it's not like it's not uh, out of the realm of possibility that all these different cultures maybe found different fossils of different types of dinosaurs because they're around for millions of years and your fir- your brain your the first thing you'd probably put that with is some type of snake or reptile regardless of whether it had feathers or not you're not going to see that from the fossil really and then those fossils easily could have been broken or damaged or just gone for whatever type of reason and we would have no clue of it because it could have been a species we never have any other record of didn't in the simpsons they like an animal an died. Yeah, like wasn't it an animal <laughs> died on another animal or something? No, so they like staged. That? They staged it. If I'm, if, uh. if we're talking about the same one, where like they excavated it and it was like all a big promotion for a mall or something. If if we're talking Maybe. about the same episode, I I think so. I I mean I I don't really know, but I just I, I think it would be so weird that if like okay, what if two snakes died right next to each other. Uh, and then, or like, it, and a bird like with wings, a bird with wings, birds do have wings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like if a bird died on top of a snake skeleton and then they just kind of like, you know, they, they turn into their skeleton. Oh my God. I can't talk right now. 
the bird animal dies on top of the snake animal and then it turns into a skeleton. And then when someone comes by and finds it, then it's like, oh, this long serpent thing had wings, you know, like what if something like that? And that's how, you know, you have this story where it's like, oh, it has to have wings. And I, I that's why I say, like, I think they did that in The Simpsons. I don't know. They've done everything, but <laughs> yeah. Well, or it's just that one jerk from the tribe who took the skeleton of a snake and a bird, and then it's just it's like, I'm going to be like the coolest dude in the tribe and show what I found. The right. jerk from the tribe. Well, I mean, I, I think like people do that now and have done that for at least with you know, recorded history with photographs and stuff. I got to believe before written history, people were still being dicks and doing stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's like something's never changed. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just a caveman who's building the wheel and then well, some other caveman just kind of pushes makes, it. <laughs> it makes me think of like, uh, remember those fake photos from what, the late 1800s where it was like the fairies and like everyone thought they were real for a while, but it was just like made up. No. People have, you don't remember that? Uh-uh. It's like, it was like, so it was like supposed to be photographic evidence of fairies. It was um, pretty popular. I think late 1800s. It might have been early 1900s. But it was definitely fake, and the dude like admitted it later, I believe. Um, but people took it as fact because it was in early photographs, and he staged them so well, it looked super realistic, and it was really hard to tell back then. Mm-hmm. But you know, people have been making hoaxes and stuff like that for as long as we have record of it. That is true. Yeah, is I know. True. I know another one too, where I think it was supposed to be a skeleton of a mermaid that they found, but turned out to be mm-hmm. like like what you said before, with just like fossils or. You know, like decomposing parts of other animals pieced together, and it came, turned out to be just that a fake. So, yeah. So, what about when they find Tusk when he's dead? What What are they gonna think? <laughs> oh my gosh. They'll find something. They'll find some <laughs> excuse to attach it to another animal. <laughs> Let's not bring up Tusk anymore, please. <laughs> oh gosh. No, we need yes. a whole episode dedicated to it. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> to Tusk. If you're listening right now and you have not seen the movie Tusk. If you have a strong stomach and you like, um, I don't know, creature features, by all means, watch this movie. But you, you better have a strong stomach. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. Let me go ahead and finish up with this this last story here. So it's the most disturbing one of all that I've found so far. Uh, it's flying cannibalistic heads. And yes, just like disembodied heads. It looks as terrifying as it sounds. <laughs> oh, Oh, <laughs> <What>? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. It's <laughs> horrifying, man. No. Oh, yes. No, Leo, what what exact what is the name of this thing? Whew. Okay, so it comes from our uh, stories are derived from the Iroquois tribe and are called the Canaan Sistotes. Can you spell it out? <laughs> I'm gonna send it in the chat, but yeah. Okay. Alexia is setting up him up to fail <laughs> by asking him to pronounce this. Oh, that one's rough. Oh, yeah. I want it, Alex to pronounce this now. <laughs> I'm not yeah, going pr- to. I can't. Just, <laughs> we don't have to keep it. Just just try it. I want to hear it. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. Let me just say it in my brain real quick. Okay. Kanan to... to can, uh, <laughs> okay. Kanan... Assist to Canantes? I have no idea. That's the best I can do. <laughs> they go by That's other names, but it's it's not much better. Yeah. No, I'm not. The other one is longer. <laughs> I know. The dog one on yet. Dog one yon yet. Uh, I'm maybe I just no. I'm not cut out for saying these words. I can't do it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> the interesting thing about these, though, is like they're reported to have deep shades of red eyes, almost like they're on fire with long, messy hair, as you can see. And the origins of these creatures can differ depending on the source or the story. And because of how far back it goes, it's like no one really knows where it came from. Uh, some believe that it was uh, the bodies of like victims that were beheaded and wrongfully murdered come back to life. And like seeking their revenge, others say it was just a creature that <laughs> needed flesh, like flesh, like its existence depended on it. Like it's just oh, I gotta get some flesh, you know, just kind of like flying around looking for people to eat. 
in my proteins. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my proteins. Survive somehow. <laughs> I mean, when you're a bo- when you're just a head, you don't have to worry about putting on pounds. So can you blame me? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so another tale of like its origin is that it came from a betrayal of an unknown tribe that had once inhabited what is now New York. So uh, during the time of the tribe, a famine had like washed over it and there was like a severe drought. And so the younger generation of the tribe wanted to leave and was like, hey, we got to find somewhere else to go because obviously this this land isn't working for us. But the elders had argued against it and thought it was a curse that they just have to weather the storm. So this, of course, drew conflict between the elders and the younger generation. And so what unfortunately happened to the younger generation, well, not the younger generation, what the younger generation ended up doing was beheading the elders. Um, but plot twist, the heads, up, <laughs> yeah, but apparently the heads came back to life and was out seeking revenge. Jeez. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but there's some good news. Apparently there was a widow that had reportedly defeated them by feeding them coal, like burning coal. So they're not invincible. That's headless that Santa. Makes- <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> It just makes you kind of like wonder. It, it doesn't have like a stomach or anything like that. So like, why would it need to eat? I guess like a zombie, like headless zombies. They kind of just, it's like a desire, like a just okay a urge, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I could see that. I think I got it. It's cannot Sistonis. All right. Just show off. I okay. looked it up. Okay. <laughs> I definitely looked it up and listened to it like over and over again, but that's how you yeah, pronounce see- it. Yeah, you had someone tell you how it's pronounced. I was just going off what I saw. <laughs> you could have done that, too. That's your fault, yeah, not mine. That, that's true. That's true. Honestly, though, the head reminds me of Lobo, the comic book character. Oh, it totally does, yeah. It does. I was like, oh, my gosh. Because, I mean, Lobo is, like, immortal, basically. You could cut off his head. Mm-hmm. He'd still be talking and going. So, like, is that where they got it from? Possibly? <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, that's my story. That's, that's what I got. That's sick. And Ro, you did Norse mythology. Yes. Creatures of Norse. So let me first get one thing off my chest. Some of the most cruelest and weird children, man. I mean, his children include <laughs> Hel or Hela, the Midgard serpent, uh, Yomun Gander. I'm going to ruin the pronunciations. And uh, the giant wolf Fenrir. And if that was not all, he gave birth to an eight-legged horse he called Slipnir. So, he, and he was, he, yeah, yeah. He gave birth to it? Yes, he was the mother. Oh, jeez. That, yes, that's oh messed my gosh. up. <laughs> <laughs> I found that most of the creatures constantly appeared to challenge the gods and terrorize men, as all good creatures must do. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the first one in my list is Huldra or Huldra. I don't know how that's pronounced. Uh, They are basically uh, the wardens of the forest that protect various different locations. And uh, this female Huldra is always described as incredibly beautiful and seductive, but with the long tail of a cow and their back is covered in a tree bark. So they disguise... Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> they disguise themselves as young women to walk in the world of men. And the power of their illusion is only broken if someone sees their tail. So what they basically do is they, they visit the human um, communities in order to lure young unmarried men into the forest where they are kept as slaves or lovers. Or sometimes the Huldra will suck the life out of them. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And if, uh, you know, if any of their victims is set free or they escape, they forever, they are set to, you know, live forever under the temptation to return to their captor. So that's a messed up life. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've just put up the uh, photo of how a Huldra looks. So it was only if the if they someone saw that their tail they would go into yeah. their true form. That's correct. So there's oh, there's also a different story uh, 
which says that uh, they like they usually send them into the mountains and she would not let them go unless they marry her however if a man did marry her uh, it is it is said that she would turn into an ugly woman but in return she would gain the strength of 10 men oh, and she would a... lose her tail <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a horrible trade off i'm sorry <laughs> it is it is so could could the man escape though well you either die and if you escape you are constantly <laughs> under the pressure of returning back to your captor <laughs> <laughs> So you choose. Uh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the next up I have is the Draugr, which are basically the undead of the Norse mythology. Now, some stories do describe them as drinking blood, but uh, they are more like zombies than vampires. They possess; they are known to possess superhuman strength, and they can increase their size at will. Like, who needs that? But they can. and uh but they cannot shake that unmistakable stench of dk and basically look hideous so like, <laughs> can they infinitely scale themselves or is there like a limit um well i don't think anyone's measured how, how <laughs> why much is no one measuring these things this isn't <laughs> it's like the angels they, <laughs> i don't know i don't think anyone's alive to measure <laughs> Yeah, this right. is ridiculous. This is just oh my goodness. Is... So, uh, the Draugrs were believed to be propelled by living out of anger and envy because um, it is believed that evil, greedy, or unpopular people were most likely to become Draugrs after deaths. And like contemporary zombie myths, it is also said that. those who were killed by the draugrs were dist- uh, were destined to become draugrs themselves yeah that sounds that sounds exactly like a zombie yes uh also they did not just attack humans they also attack livestock which makes life more difficult for humans it means that they did have some sort of um i don't know brains <laughs> they knew what they were doing unlike the normal zombies so uh while roaming and recruiting for the draugr army they would often make a snack out of you know countryside creatures because well come on honestly who wouldn't like a nice picnic after all the hard work they put in <laughs> <laughs> and well the next obvious question is obviously how do you kill them now although they seem as difficult to exterminate as cockroaches i know cockroaches have come up a lot in this podcast yeah, <laughs> what <for> whatever reason <laughs> yes They're one way over. of yes <laughs> <laughs> one way of killing them for sure is uh, by beheading them and then burning their bodies and finally throwing their ashes in the sea that's the three step program you have to follow excessive <laughs> jesus the three step program <laughs> uh yeah that sounds exactly like a zombie to me cuz i i mean i just looked up like where zombies derived from and it was like west africa like the actual word zombie but to me that what you're describing right now is exactly like what a zombie is yes cuz they're the zombies from skyrim right <laughs> 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 right. The only thing that really differs is that you were saying that they can just be any size that they want to be. Uh, okay, um, I, I think a tiny one would still be more terrifying, though. Like an uh, army of tiny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because if, if you're attacked by it, you become a dragger yourself. Uh, I mean, that would be the best way to get other people to turn is to be just kind of tiny and just bite someone's toe or something like that. Just, <laughs> 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 so uh, so what the vikings used to do is in order to avoid the rising of draugrs when the dead were buried together and needles were driven through their feet so that they don't get up and start walking oh and <laughs> archaeologists have also found evidence of weapons rendered uh, impossible to use 
uh, that were put in the graves along with the dead Vikings. And I kind of like that idea because why would you want to weaponize zombies? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, they're trying to make an army. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did it say if they were like intelligent and everything like that? Because like you think about a zombie, it's just like just kind of like strolling around, not like, you know, having conversations and everything like that. Like, did it say like, are these, these things were like, you know, still talking to people or anything like that? Well, um, they, they were, I wouldn't say gifted, but I'm not able to come up with a better word. Now they were gifted with the ability to enter the dreams of the living in order to torment them. Oh, and <laughs> <laughs> so actual nightmare for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and they would always leave behind something to show that the encounter was real so that's there so that is what I had about the joggers the last one is uh, the kraken I know that uh, <laughs> it uh, kraken is also part of uh, the Greek mythology but uh, not the actual kra- uh, kraken it is um well, the Norse and the Viking legends basically describe the kraken as a giant tentacled creature with eyes the size of dinner plates. And uh, some stories also suggest that they were so big that their bodies could be mistaken for an island. Now, um, in the Nordic folklore, it was said that uh, the krakens used to haunt the seas from Norway through Iceland and all the way to Greenland. So if uh, people who are listening pull up a map and see (laughs) what's the distance. (laughs) (laughs) And um, yeah, so uh, the Kraken also had an attack of her that would attack the vessels with its strong arms. And if this strategy failed, the beast would start swimming in circles around the ship, creating a maelstrom to drag the vessel down. And, uh, of course, to be worth its salt, a monster needs to have a taste for human flesh. Otherwise, <laughs> where's the fun? What's the point? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. But legends say that the Kraken could devour a uh, ship's entire crew at once. But uh, this time, Kraken could also bring some benefits. So the benefit being, when it, sw- uh, it swarm in the waters, it usually was accompanied by huge schools of fish that cascaded down its back when it emerged from the water. So in case if anyone was interested in extreme water sports, fishing near Kraken would definitely (laughs) pop the (laughs) chart. Extreme sports. (laughs) I just think any, any sort of water creature is just no like that's where we draw the line like water creatures I mean, for me no <laughs> like uh, justifying my thalassophobia because no immediately <laughs> just just no <laughs> i agree and uh i i also came across a very disgusting uh, the, the fish is following the kraken it's because the kraken mostly ate fish and they would lure fish to them by releasing their bowels into the water. And <laughs> they're extreme. <laughs> no one's eating or drinking anything. <laughs> their, their, their excrement was so thick and smelled so strongly of fish that it would draw many other fishes to the area for the kraken to devour. So, yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so obviously, as with many legends, based on sightings of a real animal, the giant squid, which I think uh, Tristan, you covered in the last episode. Yeah, I was actually pulling up my notes as you were talking about that. And I was like, that's literally just the, like, the exact same habitat. I mean, it's a little smaller, but it's the same. It's the same thing. Exactly. So for the, I guess for the ancient navigators, the sea was treacherous and dangerous, hiding a horde of monsters in its inconceivable depths. Any encounter with any unknown animal could be judged from sailor stories. So I, I believe, after all, the tale grows in the telling. Yeah. Right. But imagine how scared you'd be, like the real situation, right? You're like, and it'd be the Norse. So they didn't have like they'd advanced ships because they made it all the way kind of over to North America, but like not. 
anywhere near modern advanced ships, and you come across an actual giant squid, um, and I get, you got to imagine if it's coming that close to the surface too, it's probably hungry because um, maybe it didn't find yes. anything down there and it's getting desperate. So the thing's probably pretty cranky. They're probably attacking it right away just because they don't know what it is. So that pisses it off more and they're super intelligent. Like that, that would be a yes. horribly scary situation. <laughs> well, I think what you just said, like just attacking it right away and everything like that. So there was a, <clears throat> this is completely off subject, but I think that's true because you look at what happened in 1940, what was it, 19... Don't know the exact date, but it was when World War II was happening, and the um, there was UFOs over. I think it was called the Battle of Los Angeles, where like there was oh yeah, UFOs where they just started firing at it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was like one of these things where it was like we didn't try to say like oh hello, let's you know let's see what these things really are. We just started firing artillery at it, and anti uh, what was it called anti. Aircraft, you know, plane ammunition, yeah. whatever, at it and everything like that. So I can completely understand what you're saying as far as like if a giant squid came up to their boat, they're probably like, let's kill this thing right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When that's that's what I had for uh, my Norse mythology. And Tristan, you also did a mythology, but you did Greek. Yes, Greek mythology. Now, there's a lot of weird stuff in greek mythology um i've covered some of it before on different shows um specifically typhon and cerberus which are probably the weirdest of all of the creatures um so i'm not really going to touch too much on those ones instead i'm going to kind of go with more of my favorite ones um i want to start with the cyclops because they're they're just <laughs> renowned they're awesome uh they're just fun so there's two different types of cyclops um there's the hesiod and then the ones from homer those are two um poet slash historian type people and they describe them in different ways uh the hesiod ones are the ones that are actually born with the titans uh so as gay and uranus they had uh the titans and then they had eventually these uh that that one's hard it's the hecatonchery they're, they're the ones with like a hundred arms and like a hundred heads and stuff so like they're the oh opposite of cyclops yeah they're like these giant men like they, they stand like men but they're like a hundred feet tall they have a hundred arms thousand eyes like that kind of crap um, it varies from telling to telling the specifics of the numbers, which always seems to happen in Greek mythology. But regardless, they had an exuberant amount of limbs. But then the Cyclops were born, and they were a race of uh, metal workers, I guess is the best way to kind of describe them. That's that's what they did. They weren't dumb. Um, they were these big, giant smiths is kind of what happened there. Now, eventually, Cronos uh, overthrew his dad, Uranus. Um, he castrated him, actually, and that's where Aphrodite came from. But anyway, so he he killed his dad, Uranus, um, and then was scared of all of his brothers because his brothers were the Titans and then the hun hundred-armed giant guys and then the Cyclops. So he threw all of them into Tartarus, which is basically their hell. Fast forward a little bit, Zeus comes along um, after not being eaten by Kronos because remember, Kronos uh, ate all of his kids except for Zeus. And then once Zeus was ready to overthrow him, he actually teamed up with the Titans and the Cyclops to overthrow Kronos. Now... Once Zeus won, he ended up locking back up all of the Titans and the Hector. Gosh, that one. I need to look that one up. Um, but he ended up teaming up with the Cyclopses and leaving them alone. I think because they weren't as ugly as the other ones. He hated like super powerful, ugly things. I, I, just because I think his his ego couldn't take it or something. He was always just so scared of being overthrown. But the Cyclops weren't really like strong battlers. They just made stuff. So he ended up exclusively recruiting them to make all of his lightning bolts which will actually get them in trouble a little later. Um, so they ended up working with Hephaestus, and uh, eventually what happens is they all do die. Now, one of them, let's see, because there's three main ones. I need to remember his name. Um, so there's Argus, uh, Steropes, and Brontes. So the first one was actually recruited by uh, Zeus to guard one of his, let's just call him concubines, Lo. Now, this is a little bit different than the first time I read this because when he was guarding them, in the first account I read it, he had like a thousand eyes, which is different than him being a Cyclops because Cyclops only have one eye. But he seems to be the same person from what I can tell. Um, and that whole story was basically uh, Hera was super pissed at Zeus for having a uh, concubine, so he turned her into a cow and had a titan watch over her to make sure that uh, Hera never found out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and then Hera did find out, so she had Hermes kill him, um, kill the uh, the Cyclops, 
Mm-hmm. Then the other two, they died because since they were making lightning bolts for Zeus, uh, Zeus was trying to kill something in mist. I forget specifically what he's trying to kill, but the important part is he killed one of Apollo's sons. Um, and Apollo was super pissed about that. So he went and killed all the rest of the Cyclops because they made the thunderbolts for Zeus. Uh. <laughs> They're so mean in Greek mythology. It's part of why I like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I always find it so weird that like everybody else is always getting punished for like the gods' mistakes. Like, I didn't even do anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, wait, wait till we get to my my next one after the Cyclops because that's <laughs> it's such a sad story with that one. Um, but anyway, so the second type of Cyclops is going to be the ones from Homer. They're like the exact opposite. They're what you'd think of when you're thinking like giants from Jack and the Beanstalk, like that fee fi fo fum. I'm a big dumb idiot type thing. Mm-hmm. They're basically barbarians that live on islands in caves. They live on mountains. They eat people. Um, they're just big dumb brutes. Most notably, uh, you know them from the Odyssey. Because that's where they were kind of. That's where Homer wrote about them. Um, is at the very beginning when they crash land on that island, um, and uh, what he eats like six of Odysseus's men, and he gets him. Odysseus gets him drunk, and then they escape. And uh, that's that whole bit where the whole time he's uh, Odysseus is telling the Cyclops that his name is uh, No One. And so then when um, they leave, and Cyclops is like shouting at the sky, it's just like No one did this to me. No one did this to me. And then Odysseus being the <laughs> Yeah. Then Odysseus being himself, because his ego is so fragile, he then shouts his name like, oh, this was done by Odysseus. But the thing is, Cyclops' parents are um, Poseidon and then I think some sea nymph or something like that. So that's why the whole Odyssey happens is because then Poseidon is pissed at him and he won't let him go home. Mm. So that's the basic bit on the Cyclopses. Now, the next one I wanted to cover here, which again is really sad, is Medusa. That's like yeah. the, almost the epitome of a Greek tragedy. That so Medusa is one of the three gorgons. She is considered a creature or one of the monsters, but her lineage is a little weird. So theoretically, all of the monsters were born of Typhon, and I think it was Echidna is the mother. Um, but she and the gorgons weren't. They're were actually born of Phorcys and Keto. Uh, they're just water nymphs, is all they are. Um, Now, Medusa's sisters were born as monsters, but Medusa was actually born as a mortal, and she was born as a you know, the, one of the most beautiful mortals ever. Think like uh, Helen of Troy type thing, right? Uh-huh. Um, so she ended up becoming a uh, priestess of Athena. And remember, Athena is one of the virgin goddesses, so she that's one of her big things. Um, so she was watching over that temple and just kind of doing her priestess thing. Poseidon, being the brother of Zeus, couldn't resist how beautiful she was and did what they do and violated her. Oh, and. Geez. In oh, in the wow. temple and everything. Yeah. It, yeah. So that's... Hey, I, I want to say this part. Hades is the most awesome one, I think, of all of them. Because in most of the, like, the stories of the original brothers, even though he ended up, quote-unquote, kidnapping Persephone, like he was never like... He, he wasn't a rapist. The other ones, let's just say it and be honest, they were all <laughs> they were fucking yeah, rapists. Was, like, that's yeah. what they were doing, man. Like yeah. That's what was happening. Yeah. So yeah. then there's two tellings of the story from this point, um, depending on your opinion on Athena. I know I talked about it before where, like, Ovid just hated Athena. I, I just don't know what his problem was. I was thinking about it once on the way to work, and I was just like, I, I feel like he just got rejected by some girl and just, like, turned into an incel or something, and then when he was writing history, just had to be like, fuck all the women goddesses, because that kind of <laughs> seems to be his vibe. <laughs> and his version of it, basically, Athena was mad at her for allowing Poseidon to do that, so she turned her into the Medusa we know. Oh, okay. Oh. Right, which doesn't paint Athena in a good light. But then the other telling is that, um, which doesn't make, so the other telling doesn't make a lot of sense, but at least it's nicer for Athena, is that she felt so bad for Medusa that she took away her beauty so that way nothing like that could happen again. Oh. Oh, okay. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, I feel like Greek mythology is one of these things where it's like, again, there's almost like two different sides or two different stories depending on what you want to, you know, like what you want to, you know, believe the story to be. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting, too. So once uh, she was transformed into the creature, if you will, uh, she had snakes for hair. That's the most iconic one. Um, and then she also, though, had green skin, uh, wings and bronze hands. And then she gained that ability that we know to turn people into stone when uh, she looks at them. 
Fast forward from there, we move on to Perseus. Uh, that's a whole big long story. I'm not going to break down all the pieces of that. Um, but effectively, it's kind of like a Hercules thing where he has all these labors and tasks he has to do. And one of them, he is told to go get the head of Medusa for this king. Um, and it's given to him as a task, obviously thinking that he can't possibly do it. But he has Athena on his side, and so does, he has Hermes, because Athena always is helping out heroes. That's one of her main things. And he's able to sneak up on Medusa when she's asleep. And I, I believe it's his shield it is what it is. And while she's sleeping, um, the snakes look at it, and then like it turns her to stone is the whole thing. Uh -huh. And then he cuts off her head. The only thing I never knew before, which was interesting, was that from her cut-off head emerged her children because she was actually pregnant at that time with Poseidon's children. And from oh her gosh. neck came uh, Pegasus and Chirsori, C-H-R-Y-S-A-O-R. Um, he's literally never relevant, so we don't really ever talk to him. There's not a lot of... St he, was, he was a man. Um, like, he was looked like a, a human being, but he doesn't really show up too much but pegasus we all know is the flying horse yeah so hercules's horse is medusa's baby that's hercules from the cartoon not the it wasn't actually hercules's horse in greek mythology it was this other guy um bell his name is beller beller often yeah a different greek hero kind of thing though he's not really a hero i'll touch on him in a minute he's he's kind of a dickhead <laughs> because I'll, I'll get to that he's, I don't like him <laughs> but anyway so he takes it back to uh, the king and on the way uh, there's actually blood dripping out of the the head and it lands on Libya and they make a point of this because from the blood comes serpents every time the blood hits the ground it turns into serpents and that's why they describe that Libya has so many snakes is because of Medusa's head that's pretty cool so Perseus takes it back to the king, turns him to stone and all the other people there. So he's kind of out of his thing anymore. So he's not actually attached to this task set. Uh, and then he brings the Medu uh, Medusa's head to Athena. And then she does like a bunch of convoluted stuff to it and makes like a bunch of different potions where like she makes two potions and the one of her right will raise people from the dead. The other one will like make people live forever. It's a bunch of weird stuff that really makes no sense and isn't connected to snakes, which they just said earlier that the blood turns into snakes. I don't know, Greek mythology, that's just kind of how it is. But unfortunately, that's the end of Medusa. She was born of some sea nymphs, just kind of doing her priestess thing. And it all just ends badly for her, for really no good reason. And that's unfortunately a big theme in Greek mythology, is it's they love to make women suffer. Well, I was just going to say that too. You just mentioned that, um, like, or what, what uh, Leo had said, like, about how the the Cyclops were just doing their thing, making bolts, and then someone just comes there and kills them. And the same thing with Medusa. She's just chilling out, doing her own thing, and then someone lobs her head off. It's like <laughs> we see a recurring theme in Greek mythology. Like, I'm just trying to exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you think in Greek mythology, like the way it's told, like kind of through more conventional media, is like, oh, Medusa's the big evil thing. It's this big evil creature. But like, not really. She's just, Sure, she's hideous now because of what happened, but that wasn't even her fault. No, it wasn't. She was yeah. actually a she was good looking, and then that was her so, that was her problem. That's yeah. what she did wrong. She was beautiful, <laughs> yeah. and that's like the, right. the the main theme of Greek mythology is if you're beautiful, you're gonna get fucked over. It's yeah. like beauty is pain, but on a whole nother level. Yeah. Yeah. So the final thing I wanted to touch on was Pegasus, actually, um, just because I. Pegasus is awesome, and I didn't actually realize before I decided to do those that Pegasus was born that way. That was something I kind of discovered as I was just kind of going through some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, there's not a ton on him, um, so it'll be wrapped up pretty quickly. Um, the basic thing for him is he has one main power other than flying, because he was born from Poseidon, is he can actually stomp his feet on the ground and create rivers and springs. So there's two rivers called do, 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 where, Hippocrene. It, it specifically translates to horse spring, and they're literally called the same. There's just two of them, and, and they associate it in Greece to being born of Pegasus' hoof just slamming on the ground. So after Pegasus was born, he was just kind of flying around doing his free-roaming thing. Like, he was a not-tamed horse. He was just... Man, you've seen, like, videos of horses in, like, Montana and stuff. Just uh -huh. imagine those horses just doing their horse thing, but they're fucking flying. And that's what I picture <laughs> Pegasus doing. He's just <laughs> free. Just, oh, that's... Good for him. And then <laughs> Bellerephron or whatever, he comes along. This 
dickhead. And he gets a golden bridle from Athena, which will instantly tame him. So he's able to sneak up onto Pegasus, capture him while he was drinking some, yeah, he's drink, Pegasus was drinking water, and he snuck up on him, threw the golden uh, saddle on top of him, and then Pegasus was immediately tamed and effectively his slave. Uh, and then they go around just uh, basically killing a bunch of people. Like he oh takes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of. So he takes over the Amazons. He's able to destroy them and it's per- portrayed as like the Amazons invading. And then he does kill the um, Chimera, which I don't think. Um, if it's anything like anything else in Greek mythology, probably the Chimera was just like chilling somewhere. And then he comes in riding on Pegasus, like sword drawn out and just starts hacking at him. Because that <laughs> seems to be what happens. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then in another portion, he comes across. Uh, he he, ext- he he goes after revenge um, for this one dude's wife because she was in. Uh, she cheated on him. Basically, uh, I'm not even going to try with the names on those ones because they're really weird. But the main point of the story is he takes her on a ride on Pegasus with the intention of just like flying around, and he takes her over the ocean and then just fucking pushes her off. Oh my god! Oh my. <laughs> Which is oh, ironic. I know why you don't like him, Preston. <laughs> I do not like this guy, and uh, it's but it it gets better. Don't worry. So he then decides, okay, I'm awesome. I've killed all these things. I've tamed Pegasus. Um, so he goes up to uh, Mount Olympus to basically say, hey, you guys should give me a spot here. I am awesome. <laughs> Zeus doesn't like that. Uh, that effectively, yeah, that's what he does. Zeus doesn't like that because Zeus has that ego problem, and he wants everyone to be subservient to him to show him like. Loyalty, all that crap. So he takes him and throws him off Mount Olympus. <laughs> Which Karma. is the best part. <laughs> right. And then Pegasus gets to be awesome and he becomes a royal horse flying thing and gets to live in the stables on Mount Olympus for the rest of time. Well, it worked out for Pegasus, it looked like. Yes, which I'm very I'm happy going. for. Because yeah. that, that that always bugs me. Because I talked a bit about this with the Cerberus one when I talked about him, where after Hercules got him, he like paraded him around Greece for like a year. Oh yeah, yeah. They're just as mean to animals in Greek mythology as they are women. It's, it's fuck. That's crazy. Yeah. So basically, Zeus hit a a, a godly yeet on him. <laughs> There's the <laughs> word again. Yeet. <laughs> yeah. Yeet. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, those are what I covered for Greek mythology. Um, just m- mostly sad tales, but they they tend to all be that way. I feel like on the surface with Greek mythology, every time you hear it as a kid, you're like, oh, this is big and fantastical and fun. Kind of like the Brothers Grimm stories with like Disney. But then once you kind of read what it actually is, you're just realizing how dark ancient people were. That is true. <laughs> yeah. There's a dark force at play here. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like a lot of, like, they all have lessons attached to them and stuff, but, like, I I feel like some of the other stories we've kind of touched on, it's more just, like, overly creepy, scary beings for the purpose of being scary, right? Uh, Yeah. That feels like most everything you guys have talked about. With the Greek stuff, I mean, they're kind of scary, but it's more just about, like, how you can be minding your own business and then your whole world can get turned upside down for literally no reason. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. And I... it's. (laughs) I would suck to be in Greek mythology. <laughs> that's what that's what I'm <laughs> gathering. Is like, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with it. Because <laughs> like you were saying, you're just minding your own business and then your whole world gets turned upside down. It's yeah. like you're an NPC in a game. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. you, ever, you ever do that thing in Skyrim or something where you're just bored and you save and you just go kill everyone in the town? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if... if those people or the, those gods were still there and we are discussing about them. All of us would have been zapped by lightning by Zeus. Oh <laughs> yeah. Days. Or we'd be, we'd be turned into like podcast equipment. Like we would, one of us would be turned into a microphone and then the other one, you know, it just like, yeah, no, no thanks. Or just like, what if it was run like one of those mafia movies where Zeus is the boss and then slowly but surely he's just killing off everybody cause he doesn't trust them anymore. And then it's just him left alone. You know, I'm surprised that that isn't a story. I'm surprised that that's not actually what happened in Greek mythology. Oh, my God. Someone should make a show where it's basically like a crime show like The Sopranos, but it's Greek mythology. 
That'd be so cool. <laughs> oh, it would be so hard to follow. <laughs> Only if you had Zeus still talk like in an Italian accent or some shit. That that would sink it. <laughs> so what are what are everyone's final thoughts with these these creatures that we all covered? They're all terrifying. Yeah. I'd I'd say we did a pretty good job with finding terrifying and, you know, unusual creatures. That was kind of the point. I think we we all hit it. Yeah, I think it's it's more about, uh, like I I spoke uh, when I spoke about Kraken earlier. It's the tale grows in the telling. So, you know, uh, Kraken might have been a giant squid for all we know, but as the tales were passed over, it it suddenly grew so big that the bodies could be mistaken for an island. Was it? Maybe. Maybe not. And that's almost like the uh, the serpent that Leo had talked about um, in Native American mythology. That's what I'd be wondering too. Like I talk about in every episode, just about like where did these things like stem from? You know, like where do you get the idea of a of a giant snake, of a giant squid? You know, like those ones make more sense. It's the flying head that disturbs me. Where do you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Giant squid, giant snake. Okay, yeah, I can wrap my head around that, but like. The fuck, Leo? Like those I, are weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it was like a case of mistaken identity. What if it was like a bat or a bird that just had mange? Oh, there's this <laughs> thing on um, there's this post on Reddit recently. <laughs> yeah. It was like this bat that was on Reddit recently where it was like had a bull head or something. <laughs> it was this giant thing. Oh crap. Um I'll post it later if I can find it. Or like maybe it just came across like a wig and it's just, you know. Oh, wig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who was making wigs back then? <laughs> Listen, I don't know. People get creative. <laughs> was it flying? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I might have found what uh what Leo was talking about as far as like case of mistaken identity um with the flying head. I think I think this is what people were saying. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. That's so cute. (laughs) I mean, throw a wig on it, and there you go. (laughs) It's a baby owl. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, Tristan, uh, please try to find what you were were talking about. Yeah, I'll post it later um, once I find it. I'm looking through it right now. I'll I'll at least show you guys because it was weird. I think it was under like Nature's Metal or one of those ones. <laughs> nature's Metal. <laughs> Have you ever seen that subreddit? It's just like fucking things in nature doing crazy things. Normally it's like a tiger eating something, but otherwise <laughs> sometimes there's really cool stuff. I'll I'll have to join that one so I can be up to date with all that stuff. And for you, the audience, you know, if you wanna you wanna partake and see like what we're what we're posting right then and there, join join our Discord. Uh, I believe the link is within the Podbean uh, website itself or the app. So you can, you know, listen to what we're talking about. Usually we do our recordings on Saturdays. We'll we'll try to be more up to date, post that on our social media as far as when we're actually going to be doing our recordings. So you, the audience member, can uh, partake, you know, see all these crazy pictures that we're posting live. And if you absolutely loved what you just listened to, go to our social media for the latest content and where we're going to have our most up-to-date information with what's going on in the show and what you can look forward to in future episodes. And remember, we aren't looking for normal. We want stuff that's effing weird. Oh my gosh, is that the <laughs> bad? Goodness gracious. Dude, that's the bad. What? <laughs> that's a great way to end the show. <laughs> it's like a hybrid between a horse and... A cat and a bat, I mean... don't you have a speaker in every room in your home? Does it seem like a huge investment or a daunting task to set up yourself? 
At Dio, we've finally made simple, affordable speakers that you can set up in every room in under a minute. No app or voice assistant needed. Just play from your iPhone to any speakers. It's that simple. Get our launch discount at dioconnect.com forward slash blind knowledge. Hi there. My name is Chris. I'm the host of the Cult Film Companion Podcast. We are the home of movies that are off, under, and ahead of the cinematic radar. I'm a firm believer that a cult movie can come from any time period, any director, any movie studio, and covers a wide variety of genres, often within one single movie. It's all about the legacy that these movies have built up over time. Please tune into the Cult Film Companion Podcast, and remember to keep it cult. But don't drink the Kool-Aid, because it'll make you sick. Or kill you. Take care.